So can I ask you to turn to Philemon, this little letter that we have in the New Testament, and it can be found just after the little letter that Paul writes to Titus, and then that great book called Hebrews. It can be found on page 1200. So, 1200. Now, last week we read all the letter, but today we're just going to read from verses 8 through to verse 16. So, it's very short, very few verses. And God willing, we'll see how it ties in to the passage that we read in Luke. <coughs> so. So we begin reading at verse 8. <clears throat> Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is, it is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So this letter is truly an amazing letter. It was Martin Luther who described it as a noble example of Christian love. Now one of the, the reasons why it's an example of Christian love is because when Christ comes into our lives we have this power to do something that perhaps before, more often than not we never did it, to forgive others properly. This little letter is a testimony to how the gospel of grace transforms a selfish heart into one that's humble and living for God. Now, one of the longest novels that's ever been written is by a Frenchman called Victor Hugo. I'm sure some of you have heard of him, Victor Hugo. And it's called Le Miserable. I practiced that pronunciation that many times this week. Le Miserable. It contains well, oh, well over 650,000 words, and it's a massive volume. Now, I doubt many of us have read it, but I'm sure some of us have watched the film. Now, when Victor Hugo handed his publishers the manuscript, one of the things he said was this. Le Miserable knocks at the door and says, open up, I am here for you. Now what Victor Hugo said to his publisher, publishers could easily be said for the Bible. The Bible has been written, and over its pages are, open it up, I am here for you. The Bible is a book for us to read. It's not just for the old, it's not just for somebody who's been to college or university or got O-levels or A-level, it's for everyone. And it's for everyone because God wants us to know about himself, Jesus Christ his Son, and how we're saved from our sins. You see, the Bible is the source of all truth because God is the God of truth. Now in this little letter that we're looking at this morning, we come across someone very sim similar to the protagonist in Victor Hugo's book. He's not called Jean Valjean. The main character in this little letter is Wantsimus. Wantsimus. 
Wantimus, however, is very different to Jean Valjean because uh, Wantimus has bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. He's a man who knows Jesus Christ. He knows why Jesus Christ has come into the world. Now, if you remember from last week, Wantimus was a slave. He may have stolen some money or some property and used it to make his way to Rome. And in Rome, he's hiding because he's a wanted man and he's a criminal. And while it's in Rome, he meets the Apostle Paul. Could you imagine going on holiday or running away and you bump into the Apostle Paul? I know some of you may have been on holiday and you bump into the neighbour down the street. Wow, what an... The, Wantsimus bumps into the Apostle Paul. And it's when he's with Paul that Paul, Paul tells him why his heart is so restless. Why he's so guilty and why he's ashamed. And as he listens to why Christ came into the world, his heart begins to burn. And all his wasted years, his life come right before his eyes. He knows that he's a man found wanting before God. He falls short of what God requires of him. He comes under the conviction of sin and he begins to cry out to God for mercy. It's the start of the Christian life. Being conscious of your sin, your past, your rebellious life, your rebellious ways. And crying out to God for mercy because none of us deserve to be right with God. And what great joy it must have been for Wantsimus as he heard the good news that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and that he dealt with his sin, that he becomes a Christian, a new man, a different man. Now we have no idea how Wantsimus and Paul met. We don't know if it was in a dungeon, we don't know if uh, Wantsimus worked in the, in, the, in, the, in the jail, we've got no idea. But it certainly wasn't an accident. And because there's been this, 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 this radical change in the soul of wantonness, and it is a radical change. When we become a Christian, we change. And the change happens within our own souls. We become new people, new creatures. And because uh, wantonness is remorseful for all his past, for all his sins and rebellion, he becomes a valuable helper to the Apostle Paul. But Paul knew Wantsimus had, had to be reconciled to the person he belonged to. He belonged to Philemon. He didn't belong to the Apostle Paul. So what he does is he writes a letter to the Colossians. You can read the, the letter to the Colossians that he writes. And at the same time, he writes this little letter to Philemon. Now the verses that we're looking at this morning, verses 8 to 16, I want us to notice the way that the Apostle Paul asks Philemon to forgive and accept Wantsimus. Just think about it. Put yourself in the situation. Paul has to persuade Philemon to take Wantsimus back, accept him because of the change that's happened in Wantsimus' life and also remember that Wantsimus has offended offended Philemon. How was Paul going to persuade Philemon to be reconciled to Wantsimus? Now the first thing to notice from verses 8 and 9 is that Paul asks that Philemon takes Wantsimus back based on love. Now in verse 9 our Bible has the word old man. I think uh, that's uh, how most of the uh, modern day bi Bibles translate it. But the word old man, old man could be translated ambassador. Paul's an ambassador for Jesus Christ. He tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Paul knows he speaks for Jesus. He's a man who declares God's will and represents Christ on earth. Just like an ambassador does when they're in a foreign land. They represent their government in a foreign country. The Apostle Paul is an ambassador for Jesus. Now we're all ambassadors for Jesus. But none of us are like the Apostle Paul. Paul has a special ministry. It is a special ministry. And he has this ministry that gives him the authority to command the Apostle Paul had every right to command Philemon to forgive 
wants in us. Now every Christian, if we call ourselves a Christian, bow their knee to what the apostles say. Because the apostles speak God's word. And nothing what they say and what God says comes between them. What Paul, what James, what Peter and John speak is God speaking. They're not just speaking their words, God is speaking through them. And when we obey the words of the Apostle Paul, James, John and Peter, we're obeying God. Now what we learn in these verses is how Paul asks Philemon to change and accept Onesimus. He doesn't command, he doesn't issue an edict, he appeals on behalf of love. It's for love's sake that he asks Philemon to forgive and accept wantonness. Now why would the Apostle Paul do it this way? Why didn't he just wag his finger and say, Right Philemon, I command you to forgive and accept wantonness. Why does he make this appeal based upon love? Well it's because Paul knew the love of God. And the love of God had captured the Apostle's heart. And because he was so, so overcome by the love of God and how it had changed him, he knew it was the way to ask for Philemon to accept Onesimus. Now one of the things we all have to do from time to time is to correct one another. It's not a very nice thing to do, is it? There are times when husbands and wives need to do it with one another. There are times when parents have to do it. There are also times when we have to do it with one another in the church. Now how do we do it? If we hold a position of authority, then we could command or give an order or expect people to jump. We could demand change. But did you notice that's not the way the Apostle Paul did it? He didn't wag his finger, he didn't, he didn't give threats. He didn't stomp his feet. He didn't have an, an, an emotional outburst. Now why did Paul make his appeal based on love? It's because he knew that's the way that God worked. God commands us all to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are so important that he commands us. He commands everybody. This is God's command to the whole world. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ so that you're saved from your sins. If we think we're going to heaven and we've never repented and believed in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then you're in for a one big shock because you will not go to heaven. You will not be in heaven when you die. But why should we follow the command to repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ? Why should we turn? Why should we, why should we turn from our sins and living for ourselves and believe in Him and follow Him? It's quite simple. It's because He loves us. You see, His command to repent and believe in Jesus Christ is soaked in love. John chapter 3 and verse 16, we read these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now it's when we come to Jesus Christ that we really understand what love is. And the reason Paul bases his appeal on love is because Philemon knows the love of God and he wants Philemon to respond in the way that God has responded to him. The application is for ourselves, isn't it? To enjoy. If we want to see change in somebody, then Paul gives us an example to follow. But to do that, we need to be captured by the love of God. And if we don't know the love of God, then it will be impossible for us to make an appeal like the Apostle Paul does here. When Paul writes his first letter to the Corinthians with all the disorder and problems, he says in chapter 14 and verse 1, follow the way of love. Why? Because God is 
love. And then later in chapter 16 and verse 14, he says, do everything in love. The Apostle Paul is following the way that God works and his own instructions to the church at Corinth. He appeals in love because he's been captivated, captured by the love of God. Then the second way Paul asks Philemon to forgive and accept Wantimus is based upon the change that has happened in Wantimus. We read in verse 10 that Paul is appealing on behalf of Wantimus. And he refers to Wantimus as his son. Now Paul doesn't mean that he's, a, he's adopted, that he's gone down to the registry office down there in Rome and uh, signed uh, Wantimus in as his, uh, as his son. He doesn't mean that at all. What Paul is saying is that this man, this, this slave who's become a Christian is dear to him. He's close to his heart. Now we shouldn't be surprised about that, should we? Remember, it's Paul who's told him the gospel. He's led him to Jesus Christ. He's told him about the cross and why Jesus went to the cross. He's nurtured him in the faith. He's helped him. And he's cared for him. He is his son. He, 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 he looks after him. He cares for him. He's concerned about his welfare, his spiritual life. And then in verses 11 and 12, he tells Philemon that Wantimus has really changed. He's no longer useless, but useful. Now we don't know how he was useless and why he was useless. He could have been a shirker. Have you ever worked with a shirker? Yes, we have, haven't we? Some of you are smiling away even though you haven't got a mask on. All right? Working with a shirker, he could have been a shirker. He could have been rude. He, could have, he may have never said thank you. He may have dragged his heels, dragged his feet when he was asked to do something. He could have had the wrong attitude. He could have been always breaking things. We don't know how he was useless, but he was useless. But now he's accepted Jesus Christ. Now that he's humbled himself, he's a different man. Now when Christ is our Saviour, one of the things he's promised to do is to change us. And the way he brings about, it, brings about that change is by giving us a new love in our lives. Before we, become to, before we come to Christ, the person we buy down to is ourselves. It's all about me, mine and I. But when we meet Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross and see his love, he breaks those chains that bind us to ourselves. That's a lovely, lovely message. He breaks those chains of pride, of anger, of jealousy of envy and of selfish ambition. And those sins that bind us for years, he gives us the power to say no to. Now if we're listening this morning and we want to know how to stop hating, being bitter and feeling hopeless and angry, then the person we need to go to and bow ourselves to is Jesus Christ. He's the one who changes lives. And he gives us a hope and a future. You see, when we know the gospel, when we know Jesus Christ, he sets us free and he sets us free indeed. We're no longer prisoners to our passions and desires. We're free to live for righteousness. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can live for righteousness and holiness. So Paul appeals to Philemon to take Wantimus back because Wantimus is a changed man. And because God has changed him and forgiven him, he appeals to Philemon to do the same. This is the force of verses 11 and 12. This is the argument. Accept him because he's a different person. God has come into his life and changed him. Now because God has forgiven us and changed us, he wants us also to forgive one another like Christ has forgiven us. Now we often think that forgiveness should always be a blanket forgiveness. No matter what others have done to us, or how they've responded, or what they've done, we think we should just forgive them. That's it, that's the end of the matter. 
And we see an example of this, don't we, when Jesus is on the cross. He asked God to forgive those who put him there. Now we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus prays to his Father to forgive those who had put him on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it shouldn't shock us that Jesus gives that prayer to God. He shows us, doesn't it, in that prayer that Jesus is willing to forgive even the worst of sinners. Those who put an innocent man on the cross, put himself on the cross, he is willing to forgive them. That's the message of those words. Christ is willing to forgive the worst of sinners. Isn't that a lovely invitation of why we should come to him, no matter what our past, no matter how big our, the stains are in our past, in our lives, we can come to the Lord Jesus Christ in our badness, and he will forgive. He's a saviour who desires and loves to forgive. However, when we read what Jesus says in that passage that we read earlier in Luke chapter 17 and verse 3, he says, If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. He doesn't say forgive them. He says rebuke them. In other words, we're to correct them. We're to show them their sin. And what that means in practice is that we say, can I just have a chat with you? Can I just explain to, explain to you something that you may have not seen? Can I just explain to you what you've done wrong? How you've offended myself? Now that doesn't mean that we put, I think I've said this before, I mean, it doesn't mean to think the thing's trivial, alright, we should to overlook. These are serious matters. Now if they repent, the person that we speak to, Jesus is saying, if they're truly sorry for what they've done, Forgive them. And when we forgive them, we remember their sin no more. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ does. Isn't that lovely? He doesn't keep bringing things up that we've done in the past. He remembers them no more. When we bring, when we forgive, we remember one another's sins. When we, when we forgive, we don't keep bringing up the past. Jesus then says, if your brother or sister sins... Rebuke them. And if they repent, if they're remorseful for their sin, forgive them. It's when we repent, it's when they repent that we forgive. And if we refuse to forgive, you know what? We're exposing ourselves to the wrath of God. That's frightening, isn't it? That's the whole point of what we read back in Matthew chapter 18 last week. Now what Paul is telling Philemon is once of us has changed and he's truly sorry for his sin. Therefore Philemon has every reason to forgive him. This is the argument that Paul is bringing before Philemon. Forgive him because he's living a life of repentance. And there's nothing more inconsistent with a Christian than unforgiveness. Not forgiving somebody when they're really and truly sorry for their sin is worse than being sinned against. Now if we're struggling, and at times it is very difficult to, to forgive those who've sinned against us, how do we start? Well just remember how much God has forgiven you. Now the next thing that we need to notice from verses 12 to 16 is that Paul makes his appeal for Philemon to accept Wantimus based on God's sovereign purposes. Look what he says in verse 15. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Now what's Paul doing? Well, this is what he's doing. He's showing Philemon that God has ordered everything for his glory and the good of Wotsimus and Philemon, and that out of it, good will come. You see, God was in absolute control of Wotsimus' life. He guided and overruled, despite everything looking out of control. 
And because of what God had done, Paul could see how the Lord was leading and how it would be a great encouragement to Philemon and the church. Paul knew that if Philemon took him back, it would complete the circle. It would finish the story. It would honour the gospel. It would benefit both Wansimus and Philemon. Now the change that had happened in Wansimus must have been absolutely incredible to Philemon and Apphia. You know, sometimes we question and doubt the way that God works, don't we? We question his sovereignty when someone we love goes further and further away from the Lord. They may have made a profession of faith. They may have gone regularly to a place of worship. They may have even been amongst the church, a member of the church. But when they go further and further away from the Lord, we begin to, begin to doubt if God is in control. We can also doubt God's sovereign rule when our children grow up and they go to college or university or they just move down the road or into another, another neighbourhood or go to another city or town. And they turn their backs on the Lord. And again we question God's sovereignty. What about our unconverted husband or wife? It seems that over time they just get harder and harder and harder. And the more we pray the worse it gets. Mention anything about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's as though a bomb goes off. We question God's sovereignty. When, we, when it appears that things are just getting worse and worse and worse. So this is the story of Watsimus. This is what happened in his life. You know, picture the scene. He was, he was a slave to the man who had his church, had the church come to his house. I'm sure that, that, that he was fully acquainted with many Christians. I'm sure... My imagination might be running wild, but I'm sure they must have prayed for once of us. I'm sure they must have mentioned his name at the prayer meeting. I'm also sure that the church that met in his house would have made every opportunity to tell him about, tell him about Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He steals. He runs away and he's in hiding in Rome. It's gone from bad to worse. But then God begins his work, doesn't he? Let this be a testimony. What happens to once of us? Let it be an encouragement to us all. Let's remind ourselves that it's God's work and it's God who saves the ones we love. Yes, our hearts might be aching, but God is the sovereign one and he orders all time and events so that his people come to him. And if he can do this with a runaway slave, he can do it with our loved ones. Now there's evidence in history. There's evidence that Philemon and the church welcomed once of us back. There's also evidence that possibly once of us went to be bishop of Rome. Philemon must have forgiven Wansimus. The, the church must have seen what God had done in his life. Mr. Useless does become Mr. Very, Very Useful for the cause of the gospel. Now this morning, we may be thinking, what can God do with me? Because I'm a mess. We look at our lives and there's blips, one blip after another. And we ask ourselves, can I ever change? Well, the good news this morning is, God loves failures. And God loves to make us useful in Christ. And it all starts, just like it started with Paul, just like it started with Philemon and Wantimus and Apphia and Archippus. It starts by humbling ourselves. It's by accepting the fact that we've sinned and we've sinned against God and that we've lived our lives for ourselves. It starts with being humble. 
And for God to start to work, we go from being humbled and seeing our right position with God and going to the cross, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Christ came into this world to die. And he came to die for our sins. He came to be punished for the things that we've done wrong. And when we believe that, when we believe that our sins have been paid for because of what Jesus Christ has done, God begins his work in our lives. It starts with humbleness. It starts with looking to Jesus Christ as our Saviour. It's trusting in what he has done so that God's wrath is satisfied against our sin. It starts by being humble and coming to the cross. And when we do that, that path of being right with God, and it's the only path that we can be right with God, he then begins to change us. And he's promised to make us more and more like himself. So that we can become Mr. Miss Miss Useful. If you want to change then go to Jesus Christ. The promise of the gospel is he will change you because he loves you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Mm -hmm. Father, we do thank you for your loving kindness. We're thankful for the gospel. We're thankful that it's a gospel of change. You change us, Lord, legally. You justify us because of what Jesus Christ has done and then you change us internally. You give us a love for yourself and your kingdom. And Father, we pray that that love may glow, may burn brighter, may shine. Oh, Heavenly Father, may we all take up our cross and follow you. And we do pray for our loved ones, Heavenly Father, the ones that we cherish, the ones who, Lord, are very hard at this moment in time. Lord, give us the grace and the faith to believe that you are the God who saves May your name be blessed today, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.